Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 35. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer. Today's episode is with Kate Casteros, who is an economics and philosophy student at the University of Oxford, currently living in the UK. She's a Dalhousie BCom accounting grad and also a BSc economics grad, and will be continuing her studies after Oxford at the London School of Economics. She joins Sam to discuss her path to studying at Oxford, how her time began at Dalhousie and how that's changed since now studying at Oxford, her journey to searching for creative outlets, finding herself, her passions and what she enjoys and what she wants to pursue along with a whole lot more. Uh, Kate was really generous in this episode in terms of what she shared. Uh, I think if you're someone that maybe is in school right now and not doing as well as you'd like or struggling to find what that next step may be for you, um, listening to Kate talk with Sam uh, could be really, really helpful. Um, so without further ado, this is the episode with Kate. Hey, Kate. <laughs> so if we are smiling and everything, it is because we've been doing a little chit chatting and we've been double checking things on either end. So I feel like the text should be good, but you know, um, such is life. Hmm. Keisha is going to give you a pretty good introduction here. And I say pretty good. He's going to give you a damn killer introduction and help frame out this conversation. So right now, let's dig right into it. And let's share a little bit about how do we know each other? Yeah, definitely. So obviously, you were my professor in my first year of university. You taught me my first or my second accounting course. And then I had you again in my third year and in my fourth year as well for many, many courses, it feels like. <laughs> Yeah, you are one of the fortunate or unfortunate souls to have every single class I've ever taught. So um, we met <laughs> each other in intro managerial, and then you had me for the gamut. So cost at the end of third year, and then IFA2 and AA2 in fourth year. So it's been, yeah, you got a little bit of everything. Uh, and I remember you from first year, and I hope you don't really mind me bringing up this story, but it's one of my favorite <laughs> because it's one of my fails. Right. I came from teaching um, CPA candidates. So the average age of like, I don't know, 24 to like 64. And it was my first semester and I'm here and there's all these like first years and they're all excited. And then they're all not excited for a little bit. And right before the midterm, you were like, hey, is there a cheat sheet for this test? And I was <laughs> like, huh? Like, no, <laughs> there is no cheat sheet. Like there's, how do I say this? I, I really just wasn't used to like the types of different questions that would come up. And you're like, I liked it. You're sassy. You were like, wow, in, in real life, if, <laughs> if I needed to look this up, I could. And I was like, in real life, if you have to look this up, you wouldn't have a job. And then I it was like that one moment where I think we looked at each other. <laughs> and then I was like, in my head, I was like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, I am so sorry. And you just looked at me and you said, that's okay. I'm not going to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so, which I love because it was such, um, like it's such a, like you knew who you were and wanted to do much more or had more of a sense of kind of the direction in which you would take yourself. And I really liked the, the sense of knowing um, and to say that to a prof, because uh, one of the reasons why I hate my reaction is because I feel like it's a misuse of power. Like I should have just said, oh, like, you know, why would you think you have a, a cheat sheet? Or like, why, like, how, like, what do you feel like you need it for and have a discussion? Uh, so total pro, uh, fail on the prof, total pro on you. Um, and then I loved it even more because I thought about you, you know, here and there. Later on, you invited me to play basketball. So I'm like, okay, I know she's fine. And then you show up in my cost management class. And I am thinking, huh. <laughs> so tell me about the time like did there was there a point um in which you went um to you know not wanting or maybe just in that moment like no if you are accounting <laughs> I am not accounting um to when you were like hey I want to do my is it double major in accounting and um economics yeah it's actually funny because I obviously I'm not an accountant at this now at stage of my life but I did definitely do an accounting degree um I think that the change for me sort of happened in third year when I realized that accounting could open like a lot more doors than other majors would for me personally for what I wanted to do and it's funny because if you had asked me in first year too if I was going to do economics I would say no I'm barely passing like there's no way I could do economics yeah. but funny enough I guess I was wrong with what I wanted to do <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. But it's, it's one of those things. Cause like you were, you were sure. And that's good, but you are also open to bring in more information and bring in more, you know, circumstances, more experiences in order to, to change that. And I think that that is wonderful, both in like, Hey, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. And Hey, I'm willing to explore and, um, and figure it out because you know, how many times have I been like, Oh, I don't like that. Or like, I was a vegetarian for seven years. Right. Like, (laughs) um, and it changed a couple of times. Once I ate more chicken to train for rugby. And the other time I was like, you know, I'm, let's see how I feel about this for a year. You can always go back. You can always go sideways. You can always go forward. Um, so not having that fixed mindset, like Bravo. Okay. So hold on. First of all, um, take it in whatever direction you want. Um, but you ended up graduating uh, or graduating soon. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let you kind of talk about, you did these two as a double major and it led to where you are right now. Um, where are you right now? Yeah, definitely. So I'm actually doing a dual degree. So it's the BCom in accounting and then a BSc oh. in econ. Thank so you. the reason I added that in was it started in my second year. I decided I wanted to do exchange. And so I applied to exchange and I was accepted to the University of Brighton in England because I knew I wanted to go to England. I don't know why. I just knew I wanted to go to England. Um, And so I was accepted to the University of Brighton. But then I found out that if I wanted to do my accounting major, I would have to add in a fifth year. So I was kind of stuck where I was like, I have to do a fifth year regardless if I want to do exchange and it's something that I don't want to compromise. So like, what can I have to show for my fifth year? So that's when I added in the BSc. And so the BSc ended up leading me on exchange for my final semester where I'm at, I'm currently at Oxford studying economics and Greek philosophy, which is a very interesting combination. (laughs) It is. Do you mind me asking, how did you pick the combination? Yeah. So um, I had to do an economics credit just because I needed one more for my major. And then I needed sort of either a classics or an English to get my writing requirement. And my family's Greek. So I was like, you know what? Greek philosophy, why not? And then it ended up being one of my favorite courses I've taken. So I'm so glad I got the chance to take it. Absolutely. Um, I have a working theory right now about circles and just like stand with me. But like <laughs> so many times we think of ourselves as like circle or we're like, oh, we're going to get this BCom or we're going to get the CPA. Or we're going to get like, we're going to have this circle. And then you just ask yourself, how many of these circles are being produced every year? And if it's CPAs, there's like 7,000 in Canada. And like, that's cool, but that's a lot of circles every year. So then if you have this circle and then you have things that you like, like economics, so now you have a BCom and you have economics and you're like the little Venn diagram like overlap. And then you're like, hey, I'm Greek. It'd be really cool to study Greek literature, Greek mythology. Like, cool, your circle is like now, so now you're getting these things that you like, that you're passionate. You can go deep either personally, professionally, academically, or a two out of three or three out of three. And you are, you know, the overlapping um, middle. And it's such like a neat way to kind of express who you are and kind of produce who you are um, in a way that aligns with your passion. So like, it makes perfect sense to me now that you've explained it, but it wouldn't have made perfect sense to me when you first told me. No, definitely. And it's cool because I was surprised with the overlap between my economics course and my philosophy course. Just because the way that the system works at Oxford is it's a one-on-one. So every single one of your classes would be sort of like what we're doing right now, where I would prepare an essay and then I would sit down with my professor and we would go over the essay and then he would twist it to make it fit with my interests more. So we talked like a lot about environmental issues relating to economics and like my course started as collective bargaining, which is labor economics. And then we moved it to collective action and then collective action relating to environmental issues. So it was really, really cool. That is amazing. Uh, You sent me a picture uh, from uh, one of your windows or from one of the places. And it was, uh, can you describe that to me a little bit to help like set the stage of what you're seeing at Oxford? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It doesn't even feel real. Like I'll just walk through the streets and I just look at these buildings and I'm just like, wow, like I cannot believe that I'm here. It's the libraries are ginormous and they have so much history in them that you just can sit there and look around and you just feel it's weird it's like a different feeling than I've ever felt being inside of a library before you can just feel all the brains thinking and everything moving around and just all the knowledge in the room it's so interesting 
Yeah. Sounds interesting and also inspiring. Like, huh, maybe you don't know what you're going to write about when you get in there, but you sit there and you're just like, oh, like just, yeah. Like you said, feeling all those brains. Yeah. And you need to, in order to have access to your books or even to your online readings, you need to be in one of the libraries on the library Wi-Fi. So I found that was a cool switch up because in my undergrad, I did a lot of work at coffee shops, but here, if I wanted to access my readings or even I had a lot of physical books that I would have to go to the library and check out and you could only read them in the library. (laughs) So I would check my books out and sit in the library and just work out of my books. It was awesome. That is really awesome. And something that I never really thought about um, being possible or like the mechanism in which you're kind of creating community, right? Both a shared uh, experience as well as like a little bit of a shared, like uh, not struggle, but more so constraint. Like, Hey, this is like, I got a better, like, go get this done. Like, this is my time. This is my place. That's really, really, really neat. Yeah. It was awesome. All right. So how did your double not double major, your dual degree, pardon me. Thank you for clearing that up. And that makes a lot more sense about the fifth year and how that fit in with your, um, your desire to travel. How did COVID, uh, just before I move on, how did COVID kind of throw a wrench in that? And how did you do to adapt? Well, it was interesting because if I hadn't added in the dual degree and had just done the fifth year with only the accounting COVID would have hit in the semester. I was abroad anyways. So COVID actually really impacted my exchange. Um, It was hard because first I applied and that's when I found out that I had a conditional offer to Oxford. I had to get my GPA up a bit. So worked really, really hard to get my GPA up, got it up to exactly where it needed to be. And then the next day exchange got canceled because of COVID. And this was in 2021. So this was um, in October, I believe. And so I had kind of moved I thought we had moved past COVID a bit and then it got canceled so I started working towards getting an exemption then COVID got or COVID chilled out again I guess and um I my exchange was uncanceled so I didn't have to need the exemption and then COVID got worse again so exchange got canceled a second time and that's when I needed to get another exemption so I'm actually one of the only students on exchange right now because of COVID the Dow wasn't running exchanges yeah, goodness. Um, so you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, getting your grades up as well as the struggle and resilience um, in order to get where you are right now. Um, do you want to kind of build on any of that um, and to how it led to where you are right now? Yeah, definitely. So I started out my undergrad. Um, I didn't know I wanted to do accounting, obviously. I didn't, I wouldn't say I was the most serious obviously I was 18. I didn't really know where I wanted to go. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so my grades weren't awesome. Even in second year, I went through just some personal issues that, um, got in the way of my school. And I started taking six courses because that's when I had added in the second degree and my grades were just not good all around. Like I did not have good grades. So I didn't even think that an opportunity like Oxford was possible for me. And then I just started working harder and smarter and my increased my GPA. And then now it's obviously a lot higher than it was back then, which ended up benefiting me because master's programs mostly look at your last two years, which I didn't know. They do look at the cumulative GPA, but it's mostly weighted on your last two years. So to the people who may, because I'll be teaching first years for the first time um, since, I, uh, since I taught you um, in the fall. So to those first years who maybe have a a rough couple tests or um, a rough couple years, um, what would you tell them? Yeah, definitely. I would say that it's, it's hard and it's a hard feeling adjusting to university. And there's so many external factors. There's the moving away from your parents. There's starting a whole new system. I had never even studied business before I took science throughout high school and so everything was completely new. And I would just say like, don't, don't get down too hard on yourself. Give yourself that first year to adjust, but also don't make excuses for yourself. If you're not giving your best effort, you know that, and you know what you need to change. So I would say, take it as seriously as you can, but understand that if you have a bad test or if you have multiple bad tests, it's not going to compromise your future. Like you might think it will. I honestly thought it did. I was like, I will never do anything. Like, what am I going to do? My grades are horrible. But it's, it's true though, like we feel, and cause we care, right. And so you mm-hmm. care 
Um, do you believe that um, whenever you sit down and do something, like no matter what the outcome is, that it's your best on that day? Because I believe Definitely. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I believe that our best looks different every day. And sometimes like our best matches what our expectations are. And sometimes it falls short. And if we just know, Hey, this is what my best looks like. And this is how I can course correct. Um, you sharing your message really gives people permission to say, Hey, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to do my best. Um, but I'm going to give myself, you know, um, I'm going to some like, grace in the sense that, you know, um, my best on a Thursday night was making a decision and maybe I stayed out too late or drank too much and I slept in through a test. And now that means that my best was not writing that test and it's not my professor's fault. It's not, um, it's not, it, you know what? Yes, it's my fault. I'll own it. But like, I'm also first year I'm learning and, you know, my best will look much different the next test and we'll just pick up and go from there reach out, tell the prof what happened. Maybe they'll have a rewrite. Maybe there's a policy for no rewrites. Maybe there's a drop, like, and you go forward and you mm -hmm. own it because the really cool thing about you is you, as much as you have been sure and you've shifted and changed, you've always been Kate, right? You've always stayed true and been authentic, which is, um, really been rewarding um, and just fun for me to see you learn and navigate and grow and, you know, and that your path is bumpy because that's fucking awesome, right? It's always going to be, sorry, it's always going to be, you know, it's <laughs> linear is overdone. Perfection is not reality. Um, so, okay. What are you up to right now? And what is on your horizon? What are the next like couple of weeks, a couple of months, next few years look like for you, Kate? Yeah, definitely. So I'm obviously currently in England at Oxford. Um, I finished my courses in four days. I'm done with my Oxford courses, but I have um, a DAL course that I still have to finish that I had just taken an extra course. So I finished that course in four days, which is so exciting. And then I'm going to travel Europe for a month. So I'm going to go all around Europe as much as I can. And then after that, I'm moving to Greece for the month of May where I'm going to hopefully learn the language and just connect with my heritage. I have a lot of family there. So it's always been my goal since I started studying to move to Greece after my undergrad, just for a month, just to get my bearings. And then after that, I'll return back to my parents' house for the first time in a very long time. So I'm very excited for that. And I'm going to be working at a farm. So my goal is to learn how agriculture and sustainability intersect just because I don't like I have a lot of experience. I'm really interested in environmental issues and I have experience on like the business side of it, but I don't have field experience. Mm. So I'm excited to get hands on work at a yeah. farm, see what I can learn. And then after that, in September of this year, I will be moving to London, England, where I'll be studying at the London School of Economics. Um, I'm doing a master's in public administration. And then I'll have an internship. And then after that, I move downtown Toronto, where I'll do a master's in global affairs at the University of Toronto. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> lots of words. Lots of words, lots of experiences, lots of ways in which your circles are overlapping to a way which is meaningful um, for you. <sighs> like, I don't, I don't even know where to go from this, I guess. One thing I want to ask is like to the struggling Kate in first year, or second year, or like when, you know, your GPA is in where you wanted it to be, when you thought doors were closing, what is something you would tell her knowing what you know now? I would say, um, go easy on yourself. I think it's important to recognize that, like you were saying before, your best looks different always, but it looks different at different phases of your life. So in my first and second year of university, I was just in a completely different phase of my life where my priorities were different. My goals were different. My mentality was different. I just feel like I've changed so much over the past couple of years. And a big part of that, I credit to my fifth year. I would strongly recommend if people can afford it and if it's realistic to do a fifth year because, or even take a gap year in between undergrad and a master's, just because the amount of work I've done on myself and to discover my career goals and like what I want to do with my education in the past year has been like 10 years worth of work. It feels like, because I had that time, whereas some of my peers who hopped straight into a career right after undergrad, I completely understand if there's financial pressures, 
But if you don't have those financial pressures, then taking that year to just sort of see what you want to do and who you want to be, I think is like the most valuable thing I could have done for myself. Yeah, completely. Um, it's funny because as somebody who in her early twenties was racing, uh, it wasn't until I kind of hit my late twenties or early thirties that I was like, wait a minute, what am I racing towards? <laughs> like, yeah, there's really no end goal. <laughs> no, <laughs> like there, there, there really shouldn't be like, I want to continuously learn and grow. And when I master something, I want to learn and grow something else and give back and grow, not just get somewhere. And I don't know, finish the, like cross the finish line and be like, woohoo, I made it. Like, it wasn't pretty. It doesn't feel as good too. No, like no, even with Oxford, I thought I would get that. Like I would be like, oh my gosh, I got in. Like I finally made it. And it wasn't until now I'm finishing Oxford that I'm like, wow, I just studied at the best university in the world. Like it took so long because there really is no finish line. Yeah. And you got to experience experiences and, you know, have those moments where you prep for so long and you write your essay and then you have your one-on-one -on -one with your professor and you shape these items. So then you, it's almost like a metaphor that class sounds like a metaphor for life in the sense that you put in a lot of work and then you meet people or you have experiences that shape and like shift the direction of your paper, shift the direction of your career. And you need to be open and like explore that. And I like, yeah, you're right. Not everybody is able to do that. Not everybody is um, able to take a fifth year, but perhaps hopefully people in their own careers, um, balancing everything else can kind of have that moment and say, okay, am I really going to work really hard for the next promotion? Just because it's the next promotion, I feel like I should be going there. Or is there something else I want to explore? Is there, maybe I'll, you know, take a little bit of a, a different pace. Maybe I'll work remotely, even though they've explicitly said, uh, anybody that works remotely may not be in consideration for big promotions this year. It's like, okay, well, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, what is, Kate want to do? Mm -hmm. That's like a big thing I feel like I've learned in the past year about myself is just I'm really trying my best to follow my path and mm. what I feel is right for me and not what others might say I should be doing because that I feel like is what has led to some of my successes is that I feel like it sounds cheesy but it's like if you follow your heart then you can't really go wrong honestly. How do you like, what's a tactic when, because a lot of people give us advice because they don't want to see you hurt or because it, something worked for them and they want to see you like feel that same thing, or they want you to avoid pain or like a lot of both well-intentioned and sometimes just other intentioned, you know, um, items. How do you, what's a tactic that you used in order to focus on what you wanted and try to like block out some of the noise? I honestly, I just would remind myself that it's white noise and so when people would give me advice about my career if it was unsolicited then I would just remind myself okay that's white noise and then one thing that I have found has been so impactful I've been doing this since second year is it's so cheesy too it's so funny because all of the like tips for success that they tell you they sound so silly but they all do honestly work yeah like obviously um there's some stuff that like works for different people but for me personally one of the things that has kept me like straight on knowing what I want to do is pretty much every four months I update like a five-year plan. Ooh. So I built out just like this little, um, it's kind of like an Excel, I guess yeah. like, for my accounting degree. And it's just, I have like, um, fall 2020, winter 2021, like, and I'll have that going for the next five years. And then I put just like in those blocks where I want to be, and then I think of how I can get there through what can I do to get there? So like I, I knew that. I wanted to be in London and I knew I wanted to continue my education, but I wasn't really sure what that looked like. And so I, um, I just had in my blocks like London and then I ended up meeting a professor here who introduced me to the program that I'm now going to be taking part in. And he, he said something to me, which really resonated with me too, is he said, like, cause I told him that, that I do a lot of creative planning. That's like one of my creative outlets is I like planning. And he was saying how it's funny because you just never know what's going to happen and what's going to change your life. He was like, you could meet the love of your life in Paris and move there for five years. Like you never know what's going to happen. And then I was, that kind of resonated with me. And then when I got accepted to the program for my master's, I was like, wow, well that conversation with him literally changed my yeah. life because I wouldn't have known about the program if it weren't for him. Completely. So it's almost like having a plan 
and having a general direction and then being flexible and mature to kind of say, hey, like this is a plan, this is the direction. It can be reevaluated and need to be open. Um, mm-hmm. And just having the mindset of yeah. if it doesn't work out, it's working out for the best. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Completely. that's like been key. Wonderful. So one of your one of your degrees is in accounting. Um, do you use accounting at all in your current studies? I, I know you just said spreadsheets, so I got a little excited. So I'm going to go <laughs> down that rabbit hole. Um, do you find it popping up anywhere? Honestly, I am shocked by how useful my accounting degree is. I mean, I knew it was a degree. <laughs> it's it's it was shocking because I knew it was applicable, but I didn't think that it would be applicable not only for my studies, but just for my life. Mm-hmm. Like even when I was planning my travels, I was using an Excel to keep track of everything I'd booked. And then I made out a cost book to see like who had spent money on what and how we can balance it out. So everyone's like putting different things on their credit cards with all my friends And another thing that I just do again, like this happens, I do this a lot in my studies, but I do this as well, just like in my personal life is a cost benefit analysis Mm. (laughs) just to see, is this worth it? And one thing I learned at Oxford, which was funny because I was studying economics, but in one of my readings, it had the inverse, which is a benefit cost analysis, which I'd never even heard of before where like, so it's positive in like the short term. Ooh, yeah, I've like, never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was just an interesting way that I was thinking I could shape my future career around like environmental incentives. Absolutely. So it's like, I don't, I'm not going to be an accountant, but my accounting degree is 100% the best first investment I made in myself. I think it was, it's a really, really useful degree. Cool. I, I want to point out that Kate has zero degrees or incentives um, to say this in front of me. <laughs> Um, no, no but it, I really I, don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's yeah, zero, but, uh, zero benefit cost analysis. <laughs> there's no benefits, just costs. No. <laughs> um, it's, it's weird how sneaky it comes up and I love your, both your practical as well as like the academic ways in which it's come up. So thank you for sharing. And I asked that not knowing what the answer would be. So um, yeah, no, trust me. I was, I I'm shocked by how much <laughs> I <use> accounting. <laughs> I really, I, cheat. And you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, no cheat sheet is going straight <laughs> off my brain. <laughs> oh my gosh. So study, 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 test, test, uh, traveling. Um, is there any time for fun? Uh, either right now or doing your uh, undergrad back in Canada? Like, what do you like to get up to for fun? Yeah, um, I honestly love going for walks. It's so simple, but I just love listening to music and going for walks. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I also love watching documentaries about climate change. I'm just like so passionate and learning more about that, that it honestly is fun for me when I get to learn more about that. Um, And I also, one thing that I've like recently gotten into because I was at an event at Oxford and someone came up to me and was like, what's your creative outlet? And I was like, oh, (laughs) I don't have a creative outlet. (laughs) Like I was humiliated. I'm like, oh, um, I don't know, like, listening to music was that their opener <laughs> like what? yeah that was I was like wow <laughs> so that's something that I've been doing for fun lately is I'm really into different creative work like I've started painting I'm really into photography um and just making little amazing. videos I've been finding really fun as well amazing I I would also be really stuck to answer that although one of my things would probably be like I like making podcasts and I like connecting um with former former students and, uh, and sharing stories, but I agree, uh, that, um, there's definitely room to explore more creativity in our life, right? It just enriches everything. Yeah. I've noticed since that was brought to my attention, like I have been so much better at like, um, my creative planning as well now, like my, I make my five-year plans a lot more creative and Mm. they're more fun because it's like, that's a form of creativity as well. Completely. Do you think um, like physical activity uh, can be creative as well? Like learning, learning new things to expand or. Yeah, definitely. Like I love going to the gym. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I find it is just like a good brain cleaner sort of, which is the way that I see like creativity as it's sort of like a reset, a different way of thinking. 
Yeah, that's kind of where I was going with it. I just didn't know if, if you agree necessarily because a secret between you and me and whoever's listening um, <laughs> is that Saturday, I have a private lesson for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I did private because I'm like, you know, what? I want to try this, but I don't necessarily want to like be in like, just dropping on a Saturday class. So I was like, whatever, I'll just, I'll do one cor- one class. I'll maybe do like, you know, commit to a few, but I want that, you know, when you exercise and you're so intense and you're like, your brain is in there and your body is in there and you kind of just clear out everything else and solve problems. So anyways, that's kind of what I'm after. And I was wondering what, yeah, if that jived with kind of how you were thinking about creativity. Yeah. That can count as one of your creative outlets for sure. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Right. Um, it's, it's whatever um, brings you creativity. Well, and part about being an educator is I think um, recognizing that your learners are doing something for the first time. So you need to um, put yourself in that to get that empathy so that when somebody comes to your office door and they, you know how they feel because you felt like that recently for something else. And I, as much as I'm like, oh no, I'm nervous. I don't know. I'm like, this is a good feeling. This is relatable. Um, It's also creative. Okay. Um, So, um, you mentioned a five-year plan, you mentioned creativity, you mentioned um, what, where you'll be kind of in September and beyond. Um, do you have any other like overarching future plans or options you're considering? It, be, can, it can be career-wise, it can be direction-wise, it can just even be what half of the hemisphere do you see yourself living in in a few years? But what's um, anything that you'd like to share kind of above, above and beyond what you've already mentioned? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, for my career path, I see like uh, myself do it having an international career like I don't see myself staying really in one place for a very long period of time I'm sure that could change one day if I want to have a family or if I'm not in my early 20s obviously I like I can't predict where my life's going to take me maybe or maybe not but yes go on who knows so <laughs> I definitely um plan on after London exploring the states a bit and then after my degree in Toronto exploring the states a bit more And then after that, I'm hoping to head over to Asia for a bit. That would be really huge for me, I think, career-wise, just because there is a lot going on with environmental issues. It's a global issue. So I feel like I won't be as helpful in my career if I'm staying in one place. And also one thing I learned at Oxford was that if you stay in one place, you're subjecting yourself to personal bias. So with what I want to do, I think I need to eliminate as much of my personal bias as possible. And the only way to do that is to move around. So hopefully I'll be abroad, (laughs) but I obviously would love to be close to my family at points. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things there that I connect with in the sense that putting yourself in the place and understanding our own biases um, towards things that um, we are seeking actively to help solve. Right. And um, if it makes puts you uncomfortable, cool. And like, you know what? Aside from COVID, before I told people, like when they're like, Oh, you're moving to Dallas to teach. And I was like, Yeah, like fantastic opportunity, blah, blah, blah. Like 90% of our dollar is supposed to be gay program. And they're like, but your family. And I was like, there's always planes. And now my answer <laughs> with COVID is like, there's always Zoom. Like, <laughs> you know, like you make it work. And it's special when you see people. And honestly. Um, sometimes I live 20, 45 minutes away from my parents and, you know, there's more quality connections when you have to make, um, an effort sometimes, sometimes not. So, you know, um, love, love all of your plans. And I love the intent in which, um, you've made them. So yeah, I'm excited to see, uh, how, the, how these shape and grow and continue to evolve. Okay. So do you regret completing your BCom? Like, I know you said that you use accounting in certain ways, but like, do you regret it? If you had a time machine, would you go back and just like, and do something else instead of accounting? Honestly, no. I think my accounting major got me into where I am. I think that it, like, especially the, I don't know, everything about the BCom, I think was really helpful for me with the co-ops, with everything. There's no other major I would have rather done because I am probably moving a bit towards international business now, but I didn't need to major in that to do what I want to do. Whereas I couldn't have moved backwards to do accounting if I hadn't done my major in that. So I definitely don't regret completing my major in accounting. I do regret not pursuing a minor, even though I pursued a second degree, it would have been nice to have a minor in sustainability just Mm -hmm. so I could have learned a bit more about that, but there's no way I could have known that at the time. So. And you're taking a lot of measures to learn more about sustainability and immerse yourself in sustainability. Yeah. Like there, I didn't, I don't need a minor in that to learn about it. So it's fine, but 
definitely don't regret the major. Awesome. What advice do you have for management learners? And I'm going to make that pretty broad, uh, just because again, some people listening to this might be first year. Some people here might be recently graduated. Some people here might um, be graduated from the B management or not the B com. So in general, what advice would you have for management learners? My best advice would be to challenge yourself. I would say picking an accounting major was probably um, one of the hardest things for me because like in first year, as we know, I wasn't necessarily pursuing accounting and I knew that it would be the hardest thing for me. So I would say my advice for management learners would be to challenge yourself to do the most competitive degree you can, but within your capabilities. So don't overextend yourself to pursue a major that you don't even see any form of a future in because that's a waste of energy, obviously. But I think if you can challenge yourself to do the hardest thing you can do, because that's the only way you're going to grow. So I would also say, if I could give advice to like first years or what they're doing, I would say at some point in your degree, it's really important. I had one of the boss, um, a boss for my third co-op, he sat me down and he made me fill out this worksheet on sort of like what I wanted from a career, because I told him I didn't know, I had no idea. And I think that that is something really important that everyone in the management program should do, because if you have no idea what you want, then you have no idea how you're going to get there. So I think like a really important thing to figure out in a management or business degree is like, what do you want from this? What's the purpose behind this? I feel like that's important. How do people balance that? Like, what what do I want without feeling like, okay, if I say this now, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Like- is, is there kind of like an internal permission that it's like kind of what you've shown throughout your career and what I've shown throughout my career is that what you want can change. And it doesn't mean you're flippy floppy. It doesn't mean you're not working hard or that you weren't committed. It just means you got more information and you're the kind of person that's like, I want to make the best decision with like the information I have available. And if I get better information, I'll change that. Definitely. I would say um, just from my personal experiences is keeping a lot of that to yourself because then you don't feel like you've let people down when you decide to pursue a different path. If you keep that like within your close circle and only the people close to you know what you're planning on doing, then everything just comes as a pleasant surprise to everyone else once you announce what you're doing. So I think it's good to keep things to yourself. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. And just say like, well, what do you think now? It's like, I'm exploring, like, what, what are your thoughts? And like, maybe then they'll go down their own like rabbit hole and you're like, cool, like, that's awesome. Like, why, why that? Yeah, yeah, like I had people I mean. say to me, oh, are you going to be in school forever? Like, what are you even doing? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, maybe like that's none of your business. <laughs> hey, like, <laughs> that's my plan, right? Like, Yeah, I'm but it's just school. because I hadn't specifically outlined a career goal, oh. but it's because my career goals are personal. That's my goals. Yeah. You'll know once I achieve them. <laughs> yeah, no, very fair. Um, interesting. Being friendly and outgoing, connecting with people, but at the same time, like just because somebody asks you a question doesn't mean you have to answer them. Mm -hmm. And obviously if you're in a situation where you're sitting with your manager and they're like, where do you see yourself (laughs) in five years at this company? You have to tell them like, oh, I see myself being in your role or something like that. (laughs) But if it's just like your peers asking, what are you going to do with your career? Then that's your business. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of like that. I know it's not like the friendship podcast, but at the same time, um, <laughs> friends friends celebrate you and support you. And those who hate on you, are they really your friends? So yeah, you do you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how do you know when it's time, um, the right time to move on from your last role or job? Because change is hard. Um, and maybe this kind of connects with how do you know when it's right to leave the country or you know pursue <laughs> the next thing? Like, how do you know when it's right to like, leave things? I might also be asking for some personal advice, like not doubt, but just in general, like, you know, endings are hard. So how, like, how do you know when it's the right time to kind of move on? Yeah, definitely. I definitely struggled leaving Halifax in the in December, it was really, really hard because I have obviously a great life there. Like I love all my friends. I love Dal. I think it's one of the best schools ever. I'm a big advocate for Dal, but I think that I knew it was time to move on when I felt stagnant. Like I felt Mm. I had reached my growth potential of Halifax and of Dal. So that's why I really wanted to go to Oxford because I felt like it would be a really good way to challenge myself. And then it just physically felt right. Like I just knew that this was the next step that I had to take. I had to leave. And then ever since I left, like my life has completely changed and everything's been a hundred percent for the best. So I feel like, you know, when it's time to move on, you just know, 
like within yeah. you. And even though you might want to suppress that and you might not want it to be time, it is probably time and it is so rewarding afterwards. It's like, I think it's always for the best when you move on because at one point you wanted to move on. So if you were feeling like it was time to move on, then there should be no regrets there because it was time. So you bring up an interesting thing and I just want to circle back to something that we briefly touched on before we went live. And that is at one point, Halifax was new to you and Halifax was, you know, scary and something new to challenge. And that was the challenge, right? So it's not that it's Halifax itself. It's like, no, it's you, we have different stages in our lives. We have different things that we want to explore. And I believe you came from like Toronto, Toronto, or at least Ontario. So you were coming from a bigger city quote to a smaller city. Um, and it was even more, it was like the experience. And so it's not necessarily the size of the town or the degree itself, but it's like, Hey, I wanted this challenge. I'm here. And at the time when you feel like it's ready to move on, like listen to yourself because that's mm-hmm. when it's, it's just trusting your intuition and knowing yeah. when it's time. And I feel like another, like just random piece yeah. of advice I would give is doing things alone. Like when I came to Halifax, mm-hmm. I came fully on my own with no friends from high school, which was like the scariest thing I could have possibly done at that yeah. time. And it ended up working out so for the best because I couldn't have gotten as close with the people that I got close with if I had my like first friends with me, which like, I love my first friends so much and I'm so grateful to still have them in my life so actively, but I'm also so grateful for the new friendships I made. And likewise, when I came to Oxford, I came completely alone, which gave me the opportunity to get close to all the people that I met here. So it's just like independence, I feel like is huge for that too, with knowing when it's time to move on. It's like when you feel independent and ready to take that step for yourself. Nice. And the cool thing is, is you'll take that feeling and you'll take those experiences into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it's just like, I, I honestly, I had felt stagnant in Halifax that I wasn't growing anymore, but I didn't know how much more growing I had to do until I came here. And now I'm a completely different person than I was in December. And I'm sure it'll be the exact same thing after the summer. (laughs) And then another thing after my master's, it's crazy. (laughs) Uh, that's why uh, like Tammy, Laura and I often discuss that we have some of the coolest jobs because we get to be a little bit a part of your audience's life um, for a brief moment of time and then be fortunate enough to sometimes reconnect and see the growth and see, see the experiences. So thank you for, for doing this. Okay. We have a couple more questions um, left. So I know we're coming up close to our time, um, but I just want to know, like, are you a big, like, book reader, podcaster, um, you know, YouTube watcher, what recommendations would you have um, for students or recent grads as far as books or podcasts or kind of any, any kind of like media to consume? Yeah, definitely. I would say um, my main media consumption is music. I love listening to music. I have music playing almost 24 seven. I just like love listening to music. I, I like podcasts. I recently got into them because I started with like a philosophy podcast. It's called Philosophize This. Ooh. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. And then I think that if I could recommend a book to recent grads or even students, it would be The Alchemist. Yeah. Paul, that is like... Paul Coelho? Coelho? Co- yes. I, I don't even yeah. try to pronounce his last name. I tried once in a, um, a bookstore and the the guys just laughed at me. I was like, okay. Okay, so it's not just me. Paul C. Yeah, The Alchemist. Yeah. yeah, that's... I read that book before I studied abroad in high school. And then it... Like, I think I was too young to fully grasp the concepts behind it. And so I reread it right before I came to Oxford. And I just, I think that that book helped steer me towards my master's, just like following your path and like listening to yourself and trusting the signs. Fabulous. Well, that leads us to the question that I love to ask people. Um, And that is, Kate, what is your definition of success? Okay, I think that my definition of success would be doing what's best for you, no matter how hard that decision is, and no matter what the external influence behind that is. I think it's important for everyone to remember that they have a different path and no two paths look the same. So for me, I think my definition of success would be following the path that's meant for you and just trusting yourself more than external noise. Oh. I have goosebumps. I don't know how to follow that up with any comments other than yes. <laughs> yes. And th- thank you for sharing and thank you for being so generous uh, with your time. Um, normally I asked this before and I forgot to, but if 
students want to reach out, students or recent grads or anyone watching this, um, are they able to? And if so, what is the best way? Like LinkedIn or? Yeah, I would say LinkedIn is for sure the best way to contact me. Okay. And can I link it down below? Yeah, of course. Okay. Fabulous. All right, Kate, uh, final comments. Anything else to add? No, thank you very much for having me on. It was nice chatting with you. And thank you for your support through my master's program. Couldn't have done my undergrad without you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you um, for being a part of, like, like I almost felt like when you graduated, like the, you know, it was the end of, not, end of the year sounds too permanent, too, you know, ending, but like, I think that we both grew a lot um, during your time here. And um, I definitely, um, I just want to say thank you for your thanks, but also thank you for just um, for being you and for, for growing and being open and sharing that growth. So thank you, Kate. Thank you.